So this section is new. This is a new section in the PMPOT guide. Some of this information was actually in the appendix of the fifth edition. And they have moved this up into an actual section of its own. Very different mindset that they're looking at as far as how um, a project manager actually is working and what the role of that project manager is. Uh, this is also moving a lot of cases from being a manager into a leader. Now, don't change the term project manager to project lead. Um, and even in the seventh edition, they chose not to change it. But there's a lot of different roles that you could have on a project. The project manager, Maybe the fact that you're lucky and you have a coordinator or an expediter to work with you, depending on the size of the project. You have a sponsor, maybe senior managers, and I should have put an S on here because a lot of times we have a number of different managers that we want to have. Um, and then the functional or resource managers for the actual people that are in. Uh, that, that your team members report to, and then a lot of times your project management office or PMO. So in the PMBOT guide, they made this analogy between a conductor and a project manager. And I have to tell you, actually, in addition to having a math degree, I also have a music degree. I had a major in music. And part of that was that I had to eventually take a conductor class. But before I could take a conductor class, I had to take, I had to understand how to play all the different instruments. I couldn't necessarily sing the different voices within a chorus, but I knew the difference between them. But their analogy talks about the fact that both a conductor and a project manager have a lot of different people that are part of what they're responsible for. Different members, different roles as they're part of that group. The conductor and the project manager have the responsibility for the delivery of whatever it is, whether it's a project or whether it's a concert or whatever that's going on here. Where the difference changes though, is that as I said, as a conductor, I had to understand and learn to play all those various instruments. Not well, but at least I understood more than just the theory behind an instrument and actually had to do it. The project manager though, they do not expect the project manager to have either played every role that's on the team or even be that familiar with it because you're relying on that lead person who knows what's going on to give you that information. And a good project manager makes sure that those leads are far superior to anything they ever could do. So the difference kind of breaks down in that PMI doesn't expect a project manager to have done everything previously but instead to rely on that expert, that SME, that person that can provide that information to them. So when they talk about the role of a project manager, this really becomes that critical leadership role. And as I said, we're gonna, we're gonna see a lot of changes here to be able to move from that command and control management role into more of a leadership. Being visible throughout the project, involved usually from the beginning to the end, that's kind of best case. Unfortunately, I don't think I ever was completely involved. Well, maybe on a few small ones, but usually I either was brought in to help put the plan together and once it started working, turn it over to somebody else. Or if there were really some problems, I would be brought in the middle to get it back on track. 
um, as I go through. But communicating, making sure that we understand what those strategic objectives are to make sure they get done, improving the performance, but especially meeting those expectations. And I just had to put my title down on this presentation I'm doing Wednesday night. And I call myself an engagement manager, not a project manager or a program manager. And it's because most of my time is spent understanding the customer and their expectations, customers, stakeholders, things like that. If I have a team that's working on something, I'm not spending all of my time making sure the people on my team do what they're supposed to do. If we understand where we're trying to go, we get people to allow us to, to send that information to, to get back and work through that. So this is one of the charts that they show. Um, and it's kind of interesting in that sometimes they call this a onion uh, diagram. I, you know, not sure that that's, I understand what they're saying. But the idea is that as a project manager, you have most of your influence over those people that are on your team, other project portfolio or program managers, and some influence over the resource managers, provided you've done your homework and, and created those relationships. I also can have some influence over some of my other bodies as far as steering committees or PMOs, et cetera. Not from the standpoint of telling them what to do, but maybe providing alternatives for them to help work with me on that. So I can still influence a lot of times um, the, the types of things that are gonna be done at this level. The area that I have some influence on, but not near as much, comes with the stakeholders, the suppliers, the customers, the end users. Now, because you're in a very highly regulated environment, I'm gonna say there's another circle here, and that has to do with the regulatory aspect. And in some cases, it also has to do with some of the lobbyists and the people that are working in Washington or in um, Reno to make sure that you have, that things are coming across, the regulations are put in place, et cetera. Those are some that we probably don't even know who they are. At least with our stakeholders, we should be able to identify at least groups of stakeholders that we can work through. So they have taken now, and they've said that the role of the project manager is gonna change. First of all, this role within the project, that's pretty much what it's always been. Now, leading the team, balancing all those constraints, and communicating and using other soft skills to balance the different things we have to do, okay? But now they're saying project manager, Look beyond just your project. Look at the organization in general. Interact with other project managers, understanding what they're doing. And a lot of times, because you have the same kind of resources that you're gonna need. Realizing there's prioritization of who gets funded and sometimes within the organization, we may have to be the one to say, hey, look, this is what we can do, why we need to continue going. Um, how do we work within that organization, their goals and objectives? So seeing the project, but seeing it within the organization. Um, when you look at it the next higher level, you're looking at it within the industry. Okay. So you're in a very different industry than most of the rest of Nevada. Okay. And as a result, you need to understand the current industry trends, any sort of product technology development, any standards regulatory that you have to have, any sort of economic forces. Okay. 
right now you probably aren't impacted like unfortunately those other project managers in Vegas and, and even in Reno with the casinos. Um, and then what are some of the strategies, the process improvement that other people are coming up with? Now, that whole area, you're looking beyond just your project and the company into the industry that you're in. Now, this doesn't say that because you're a project manager in that industry, you can't work in other industries. And I have worked in so many different industries. But what it says is that if I work on a project in that industry, I need to understand a little more about the industry. What's going on? What kind of changes are happening? The other one they talk about has to do with you and the fact that you're a project manager, understanding how project manager, project management is changing. And one of the reasons I was asking about the agile is because this is the real trend that we're having within project management. A lot of different ways you can do it. PMI actually has gone so far as to purchase and incorporate the discipline agile method in, which I personally think is far superior to most of the rest of them, mainly because of the fact that it gives you different options. There's no one way of doing things, but it still has the, the mindset. But those type of things are what you have to be kept up to date with. And part of it too comes back to the pat. Once you get certified as a PMP, you have to continue that education. You have to continue to stay up to date on what's going on. Now, just not just project management, but some of the other disciplines. So for instance, I mentioned the practice standard for business analysis. There's risk management practice guides. There's other disciplines that have a lot to do with what you're, you're doing. Your IEEE, your engineering, all of those type of things. We need to understand not just project management, but we need to understand these other situations that we have. So when we really look at the responsibilities, the project manager is linking between the strategy and the team. Why are we doing this? What do we have to, to work with? Applying that knowledge, tools and techniques to the project itself, and especially understanding what constraints we have, whether they're real, and how do we have to work with them within our project. Now, working with the team members, leading, not managing, not command and control, but making sure that the resources are appropriate, they have what they need to be able to do their job. And we'll see a lot of the servant management, uh, servant leadership ideas as we start to look in this. So we talk about some of the knowledge and skills that we have. The fact that, yes, a project manager should understand project manager, project management, the theory of project management. What do we do? But they need to go beyond that and apply it. They need to understand that, okay, so I can put a budget together, but what does that do? Why am I doing it? How am I going to do it? What level of detail? Who needs to see it? That's what we have to figure out is how we apply this knowledge that we have. And that comes from experience. But the other thing has to do with these other skills, these skills of, of being able to figure out problems that are occurring, other type of problem solving skills, personal skills, communication skills, those type of things that are going to help us make decisions and manage the team. And then they added this last one this time that has to do with the personal. With the idea that if we are a project manager, we are working with people. And part of what we have to understand is how do we work with people? Those soft skills, what kind of personality, what kind of attitudes, what are our ethics that we have to make sure? And how do we actually lead 
And especially a lot of times we have to lead when we don't have the authority, but we do have the responsibility to get things done. So what PMI has done is they have kind of put this into three categories. The idea of technical project management, leadership, and strategic business management. And what they've said is that a project manager needs to have skills in all three of these areas. So in order to reinforce it, what they've actually done is say that after you get your PMP, in order to keep it active or to renew it, you have to have so many hours of training in all three of these areas. So you're required to have a minimum of eight hours during three years, eight hours in technical project management, eight hours in leadership or soft skills, and eight hours in strategic and business management. And you will see as you go look at webinars and um, conferences and things that are out there, every time there is a presentation, it will identify where the PDUs, as we call them, actually the product, the professional development units, where, which one these fall under. So your technical skills, these are your traditional. Do you know how to apply both agile and traditional methods? Do you know how to plan? Can you create your schedule and your cost and, and risk and all of those situations um, that are basic project management skills? The strategic and business management skills are a little bit different. This is where, once again, I'm looking beyond my project. I'm looking out into the organization. I'm looking out into the industry to understand where we are. So we sometimes use the term business acumen when we talk about these type of skills. Do we know who our competitor is? Do we know the environment? Do we know where the revenue comes from? Do we know where the strategic objective, the direction that the organization is trying to go? Um, this is where we're working with a lot of higher level understanding. Uh, and PMI really wants a project manager rather than to just look down into the project. They want them to look up and figure out why. What is this vision of what this project's going to accomplish and how does it fit into the rest of the strategic uh, impact of the organization? So this is a chart. Actually, it's not in the PMBOK guide, but it's in portfolio and program and every place else that really goes back to that idea that the organization has a vision and a mission, and then they come up with organizational strategies or objectives. And those are what drive the portfolio management to determine what kind of projects and programs are going to be done. Now, chances are you can go out someplace, either on your website or maybe in some areas um, on the wall within the building where the vision and mission are actually um, stated. I did some work up at Disney. When you walk around the Disney campus, the flags on all of the light poles have their various, um, their vision statements and their different objectives and, and principles and things that they're listed. So everybody sees them. And this is once again, looking back up at the organization because the project is done in that environment. So the mission then has the objectives, which is what we decide we're going to work on. Your goals are your milestones and the resources that are needed to get those. And then the strategies are where we actually go. The organizational strategies are what drive um, the portfolio to determine what kind of resources are needed to support those objectives and goals. So we have the technical skills, we have the strategic skills. 
our leadership skills are the big ones. Ability to guide, motivate, and direct the team. Being able to work with people, uh, different behaviors, motiva motivations, but still being respectful. Being a visionary, helping be the positive, optimistic person. You know, the glass half full rather than half empty. Um, and actually, when we start talking about risk and we talk about threats versus opportunities or, you know, poor, you know, things that are not good versus things that are positive. If we really look at most things and we're optimistic, we look at the positive side of it. Okay. Right now, we could say that, oh, this was horrible. We had to all work from home. We couldn't um, go into the office. But how many hours did you spend? Well, probably up there you don't spend hours, but you spend minutes still commuting. If you're not going into the office, how, many, how much more work do you get done? So if I look at everything and look on the positive side, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Not concentrating on everything that could go wrong, even though we probably need to still be aware of it, but looking at the positive side. Collaboration and effective teams. This is probably, once again, where we need to spend more time working together, having to, to get into those. Understanding relationships and conflicts. And I, I have a hard time with conflict. In fact, I've done a couple of webinars on this and I'm getting ready to teach a class for a company up in Northern California on conflict management. And what I keep telling them is, look, we don't have to get to a conflict level. Yes, we're going to have disagreements, but disagreements can help us come up with a better solution. If we understand that we have the right to disagree with each other and come up with listening to each other, once we stop listening, now we're more into that conflict area where it's past the point of really being able to get any sort of positive result. And then last is the communicating. And we know pretty much for a fact that project managers spend about 80 to 90% of their time communicating with the team, with the stakeholders, with everybody else. So they added this additional thing in here as far as interpersonal and team skills. Now, I made the comment that some of this came from an appendix in the fifth edition. They move this from an appendix right up into the third section. And this is where you look at all the different aspects that there is an expectation that a project manager would have. Now, I just want to pull a couple of places here. So uh, let's look at negotiating, for instance. There is usually a three-day class on how to learn to negotiate. That is not what PMI is talking about here. PMI is talking about working with other people to come up with an answer. Influencing, communicating, facilitating, all of those things are areas that are those interpersonal skills that they talk about. So in effect, each one of these is explained in about probably an inch worth of text. So it's not deep. It's just more understanding what is leadership, team building, et cetera, as you go through. But these are the areas they're trying to move the project manager from a manager type of environment, especially command and control, into more of a leadership type of a position. So what they did was they added a bunch of things in here. Now, I, I personally look at this and say, okay, some of them are more important than others, but they do talk about making sure that we get things done. <clears throat> and you can get things done in different ways. <coughs> Sorry. Your project manager, when they are actually named as the project manager, take on this positional or formal legitimate power. You've been given that power because you're 
been assigned to be in charge of the project. Now, that's fine. But in some ways, you have to figure out, so just because I've been named as the project manager, what does that really mean? So there's a couple of other powers here. And these are very different based on the culture of the organization. And I always say this because now being in California, a lot of this we are not allowed to do as a project manager anymore. We cannot reward people individually. We can reward the team. And we definitely can't punish or use any sort of coercive power on people on the team to get them to do things. So we're going to have to come up with some other ways of doing this. Okay, This it makes it a little difficult when you start to talk about how people are, are working. And, you know, people that are competitive, they want to be rewarded when they really do a good job. And so it depends on your organization, depends on whether these powers are actually even allowed. Pressure-based and guilt-based, I don't like personally. I don't think that is the way to get things done. You don't pressure people. You don't make them feel guilty. Now, I have to stop and say, I have some grandchildren. I have a grandson that's three. This is not the way you get things done with him. You don't pressure him to do something. You don't make him feel guilty if he doesn't do things. You reason with him. You explain to him what you need to have done and how important it is that he does it, those type of things. I just personally, I'm not the type of manager who likes to use any of these. Um, I tend to prefer to, to use a little bit more uh, some of the other areas. Now, I may have certain people on my team who really have more power than me. Informational power, because they know a lot of things, they have a lot of data to support them, so they're going to have some type of power. Situational power is kind of the same thing, but that's more of a, big, a situation where, or a case where they have been in a situation previously, they know what to do, how to, how to work through it. So they have a little bit more situational power. These, these I tend to see on individual people in individual situations. Your ingratiating, relational, persuasive, personal, character, charismatic, those are more the soft skills where I'm working very closely with other people and if I can set that relationship up, then I have a little bit more ability to influence what's going on. Um, to me, these are the important ones. If I've been named the project manager, I want to have the team look at me and respect me, not because I was named the project manager, but because they feel that I'm the best, um, that based on my examples, the things I've done in the past, the way I've worked before, the credibility, uh, being able to, to look at that as we go through. The second one could be similar to that informational or situational power and this idea of an expert power. Somebody just really has that special knowledge or expertise. And they're not really saying, okay, so you're more important than the project manager. We have to get all of these together to work together. But the reverent power and the expert power are what they called earned power. These are not given to somebody. These are powers that the team basically bestows upon them because they feel that they have either the, the respect or that special knowledge that goes into this. This table right here is probably um, one of the most critical areas of how the change in project management has moved from leadership um, 
from management. So the idea that the old way, I should say the management way, would be where you would be using that positional power to get things done, as opposed to using the leadership idea of guiding and influencing. And you can read through these different areas. You will see this movement as being one of the biggest areas that PMI has embraced. And a lot of that comes from, if you are familiar with the manifesto from the Agile Manifesto, they talked about things that were okay, but we would prefer something better. So it's not about saying you don't want to ask how and when, but what's more important is you be, should be asking what and why. So these over here are the direction we want to go rather than just accepting the status quo. Hey, we've always done it that way before. How might we do it better? Doing things right versus doing the right things. Focus on, rather than just looking at problem solving, focusing on continuous improvement, alignment, moving that direction. This table here is one that you probably need to know just a little bit more than some of the other tables. So they also talk not just about the power, types of power, but they talk about leadership styles. Okay. Now, as we go through these, what I'd like for you to do is kind of think about, do you have people in your mind that you've worked with who actually use these type of leadership styles and whether it was good or bad? Okay. Laissez-faire basically says, I'm, yeah, I'm the manager, I'm leading, but you guys go do what you want to do. Hands off, it's up to you. This is somewhat when we talk about the scrum master sometimes in saying, you know, I'm the scrum master is not in charge of the team. They're just there to make sure that obstacles get removed. The team itself has to work together. On the other hand, not only are you not being involved, but you refuse to. That's that avoiding. That's one of those where not getting involved, not helping make decisions, um, sometimes does a lot of churning with the organization. A transactional, this is where I think a lot of our project managers who've been around for a while, they're focused on making sure things get done focusing on those accomplishments, making sure that we come in ahead of schedule, make sure we come in under budget, but maybe what we deliver is not what we really wanted. So that transaction is more task oriented. Whereas the one that they want right now and the one that's preferred is this idea of a servant leader. And I don't know how much you've actually looked at this or seen this, um, in addition to the PMBOK guide, you also have the Agile Practice Guide. So whether you downloaded it or whether you got a hard copy, in that Agile Practice Guide, there's a couple of really good things in it. The rest of it, you know, I could take it or leave it. But one of the things, um, the people that wrote that, they did an excellent job of explaining how servant leadership really can apply to a project. So if you're not familiar with this, you know, take a look at it, maybe even look at within the Agile Practice Guide. But this is the idea a project manager leader is putting the team first. So it kind of turns upside down the uh, the pyramid. So the project manager is not on top and the team's on the bottom, but it's the opposite way. Transformational, charismatic, interactional, once again, some of the other leadership styles that become a little bit more of the soft skills. Um, being able to encourage that innovation and creativity, the charismatic, the relationships, working with different people, um, understanding their needs, 
a lot of time spent there. Um, it's not easy, but those are the areas that I think what PMI is looking at is moving a project manager more into that area. So then the other thing they talk about is this idea of personality. And the personality being differences that people have and how they're going to work with other people. Um, this didn't used to come into account because a lot of times, you know, the project manager was expected to just deliver the project and do whatever was necessary to get the team to make sure they meet those objectives. Whereas now, finally recognizing that the people on the team are people and they actually have ways of doing things, they have personalities, there's cultural areas, and being able to take all of those things into consideration. So these are some of the actual personality areas that they, they call out. And it's, it's like everything else. I mean, it's a change. And, um, you know, when I talk about organizational disruption and organizational change, you got people. And change has to come from people. Um, and so we'll talk later on when we talk about motivation. You know, there's different ways to motivate people. And part of it is, you know, do we motivate them by telling them what to do, or do we motivate them by giving them a little bit more flexibility in what they're doing? So, yeah, it's it's a little different as we go through here, um, looking at the different uh, aspects of, you know, this whole section. Like I said, this is a section that was changed. Um, this came in um, and was different in this particular six edition they added this in so this is this is taking project management more away from this is what you do into maybe this may be a better way of how to do it so still structure but understanding that a lot of it is the leadership of the team that has to be there okay so let's see if we can continue I was trying to see if i could make this I don't know why this this is showing up the way it is, but anyway. Um, okay, so let's go back. Um, number one, which of the following is least likely to be the role of the project manager? Least likely. Actually, we talked about understanding what's going on prior to initiation. Talked about maybe assisting in some of these aspects, maybe consulting on those. We are not really responsible for the organization and the efficiency of the organization. So A would be um, the fact that would be the least likely of the role. So then number two, least likely to be within that sphere of influence. Think of that onion. I kind of gave this away because I said I was going to add another level to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your project team is the most, that that's the one that you have the most influence on, and then maybe your sponsor, and then maybe your customers and your government or regulatory would be the, late, the highest level. Key competencies, except. What were the ones we talked about? Okay, this one goes back to our, what they call the talent triangle. Okay, the idea that there are three main things. You have technical skills, leadership skills, and strategic management skills. So operation management would be the one that you would not have, okay? This goes back to the section they talk about and they have that triangle. So what are, whoops, sorry, um, differences between management and leadership. So this goes back to that chart. And because you don't have copies of the slide, how about if I go, well, I can't show both of them. Well, maybe I can. 
by the way, there's that talent triangle. Key differences between management and leadership, except, so look for the one that's not there. So this one is there, rely on control, focus on the bottom line versus focusing on the horizon, accepting the status quo versus challenging the status quo, and then concentrating on activities versus emphasis on results. So this would be the one that was really not there. Okay. This is a chart. This is a chart you probably really need to, to look at. Okay. So then number five, which of the following are forms of power? Positional, referent, personal, cultural, relational power. What you're looking, this is what a lot of times we consider a hard question on the exam. And the reason being is because it takes time. Because you have to look at each one and say, okay, so is there anything here that throws that question out? Now, what about the next one? Were those all there? So which one has all of these? Positional, reward, punitive, pressure-based, guilt-based, informational, situational, ingratiating, relational, persuasive, personal, charismatic, referent, and expert. Well, which one? Okay, we don't have personal, so that throws this guy out. Positional, relational, informational, expertise, expert, so referent, personal, expertise, cultural is not one, social is not one, so the answer is B. This is one of those areas where things like this, you've got 200 questions, this would probably one be one of those questions that I would hold off on. Now, if you're taking it online, you can't, once you get past the first hundred, you can't go back to them again. But I would, this is the type of question I would have marked. And I'd say, oh, it's going to take me so much longer to do. Let me go worry about other questions and then come back to it. Um, the, when I took my PGMP certification, so many of the questions were like this and they just take so much more time because you have to go through each one and say, okay, so which one, is there something here that throws this one out as you go through? Okay. So the answer is B. Positional is there. Relational is there. Informational and expertise. So the same thing here when we talk about the leadership styles, which one is not? It's going to be B, the motivational. Laissez-faire, charismatic, and servant are. Motivational is not. So number seven, which is not a similarity of a project manager and a conductor, which is not. How are, in other words, how are they different? Trying to find the slide, sorry about that, here. Which of the following is not? In other words, how are they different? Do they both need to be an expert in all roles? Are they both responsible for the final product? <clears throat> Do they both communicate with the team, whether it's the orchestra or the project team? Do they need to integrate multiple disciplines? So which one do they not do? Yeah, that's the key is a project manager does not have to be an expert in everything. <coughs> in fact, they're probably better if they aren't. Um, but they do have, they are both responsible. They both have to communicate and they need to integrate all these things. So which one of the following was that earned power? Remember, there were only two of them. An earned power rather than being given that. 
first of all, there wasn't a cultural power, so you could get rid of that one. So out of these three, which ones would you say you earn? You have two earned powers. One is your referent and one is your expert. Your positional power is given. Your informational power is once again given kind of because you have information that other people don't, which is not part of that talent triangle. Should be pretty straightforward. Strategic and business management is there. Leadership is there. Technical project management is there. So the one that's not is the personality. It's not a project management skill, but it is considered to be an interpersonal skill. And they talk about personality. Um, those are some of those other skills that come in more as the uh, interpersonal skill. Which of the following is more of a management style than a leadership style? When you're talking about management, we're really, a lot of times remember when we said that if you were in the operational area, this is an area where you would have additional management skills because you'd be managing people in, in an operational area rather than influencing, collaborating, innovation, focusing on people. So this is an area which is new, uh, especially to most project managers. This is not necessarily something that um, a lot of project managers are used to doing. Let me just stay here for the time being. Um, okay, so we talked about the foundational elements. And just as a quick review, especially because I know some of you have gone in and out because of other meetings. Talk about foundational elements. We're talking about understanding things like what is a project, what is a program, what is portfolio, how do those fit together. Um, that first section, definitions, okay? The second one that talked about the project environments has two pieces to it. The first piece has to do with those influences, the environment. And we're gonna see this when we get in, like I said, into all the processes. You have two things, you have EEFs, external influences, and you have OPAs, internal. Those are things that impact how you do your project. External could be external to the company, like a regula regulatory requirement, or it could be internal, the way that you have to do things in general, outside of a project. Okay? The second part is the OPAs, or the organizational process assets. And think of them as two things, templates, and historical information. Templates, policies, procedures, templates, things of the way that you run your project. And then the other is the historical information. The other part of the environment has to do with the structure. Are you in a functional organization? Are you in a matrix, weak, balanced, strong matrix, or the actual project oriented, or is there a composite of those? And then the last part had to do with the PMO. The fact there's three different types of PMOs. The supportive PMO, which is providing you with OPAs basically, policies, procedures, templates, training, things like that. Your controlling P PMO is where a lot of the governance, making sure things are done the way they're supposed to, a little bit more mature type of a PMO, but also one that's not quite as flexible and has a little bit harder time of transitioning when we move from traditional projects to agile. And then the third one had to do with the directive. And the directive is in effect the organization where project managers kind of report. 
Um, usually a directive also is one or both of the other ones also. And then we talked about the role of the project manager and the role of the project manager being not only within the project, but within the organization, as well as in the, in the industry in general, understanding how they're going, a project manager has to continue to stay abreast of project management changes, as well as understanding other um, disciplines, risk management, procurement, all of these other, uh, other disciplines that people come from. Also in here, we were talking about the different movement from management to leadership, the different management styles, the different leadership styles. So that's really what these first three chapters are about. This next section, if you notice in here, I say it comes from a couple of areas very close up front with the PMBOK guide, but it also is part of the standards section. Now, just to clarify, when you get the PMBOK guide, it's actually two documents. The first part is considered the project management body of knowledge. It's the global standard of how you would kind of do things, best practices. The back half, which we call the standard section, is actually the ANSI standard for project management. Now, the difference between the two. First of all, the PMBOK has been done in this order for many years, where you have each one of these that we'll talk about as far as the knowledge areas, scope, schedule, cost, where you look at everything about that area. When you get into the standards, it's not based on scope or schedule. It's based on initiating the project, starting the project, planning the project, actually executing and monitoring, controlling the project, and then closing. It's actually done more the way that I teach this class. Now, the other thing that's different, when you're in the PMBOK guide, there's a lot of information about tools and techniques. Now, every time it says these are potential tools and techniques, the PMBOK guide says, including but not limited to. So these are suggestions of ways that you can do things. The inputs and the outputs are once again the idea that you create documents or things and you use them in a further process later on. Sometimes it just goes like from one step to the next, like in schedule, for instance. And in other cases, you have something like a change request and you have a change request coming out of all sorts of different places and you need to know where it's actually acted upon. And those are some of those inputs and outputs. Now, in the standard, the tools and techniques have been dropped. They're in a different new uh, way of doing this. It's actually called Standards 2, which is an online system PMI is putting together where you can look those things up. But for the most part, the how to do project management has kind of been slowly removed. And when we get into the seventh edition, you're going to see even more so. It's not going to be based on this structure, and it's not going to be based on tools and techniques. It's going to be principles, things that you should do, things you should understand the importance of leadership, the importance of stakeholders, working with people, whether they are your team members or your stakeholders, very different approach to project management. And part of that is because it's gotten to the point where people memorize the infamous page 25, which has all of the things on it as far as the processes, they memorize the 1200 
I don't know why anybody would, but 1,200 inputs, outputs, tools, and techniques. That's not project management. Project management is meant to understand why you might want to do a particular process. And if you're doing it, how might you consider doing it? So that's really what we're talking about here in, these, in this next section. So without going into very far right now, because it's almost lunchtime, we'll talk about the difference between the project life cycle and the product that we're producing and the life cycle that it has. We'll talk about if we have a life cycle with phases, and I say it's if, and what you kind of said was you don't have them, so I'm not going to necessarily say you must put them in, but you need to understand what they are and why they might be there. And if you have phases, do you have what's called phase gate, to say that you've finished a phase and now you can move to the next one. But the big thing we're going to talk about is the processes. There are 49 processes. They're grouped into either a process group. Well, they are grouped into a process group and a knowledge area. A process group is based on when in a project you would be doing something. So for instance, one of the processes we'll talk about this afternoon is identify stakeholders. Stakeholder identification starts at the very beginning of a project, but it continues all the way through the project. So the process group would be the starting point, the planning, the initiating, the planning, those type of things. Your knowledge areas are special areas, things like Okay, what's the quality aspect we need to worry about on this project? What kind of resources do we have? People, equipment, supplies. What about things like communications? How many different communications do we have to put out? Who do they have to go to? When do they have to be created? When do they have to be delivered? So the knowledge areas are looking at specific aspects that might be very critical on your project and they may not be. It just depends on the project. Okay, so before we broke for lunch, we talked about this next section, which is kind of a combination of a lot of different places that they're talked about within the PMBOK guide itself. Um, but I wanna kind of put it into a section all by itself as far as definition. So looking at the product, which is the result of a project, and talking about the life cycle of that product, as well as the life cycle of a project itself. Now, once again, this whole area of the life cycle of the project, as well as phases and gates, is dependent on the approach that we're going to use. So there are different ways that they're recommending a project be done today, whether it's in a traditional manner or whether it's more of an agile type of an approach. We'll also then talk about these processes, process groups, and knowledge areas. So by definition, that product is the artifact that's produced, whether it's an actual physical end item or an enhancement or a component piece of a product. It could also just be a service or capability that we've added through the result of this project. Could be an improvement to an existing product, just as much as a brand new one. Um, we can use the term project, product, result, solution, all these different terms we use for what happens when we finish the project itself. So, <clears throat> Generically, we talk about it from the standpoint of a product. But if we look at a product, a product has a life cycle. We come up with an idea, we figure out what we want to do with it, we develop it, we continue to put it into production, we enhance it, we grow it, get it to the point where it's mature and it's kind of sitting by itself. And then all of a sudden we decide that, hey, this product really isn't that useful anymore. Most often it's because we replace it with something else. So that life cycle 
that we go through as far as the product has a number of different stages inside of it. The key that's important is every time I move from one to the next, I am using a project in order to make those, especially when we get into the growth area. So every time I come out with a new version of the product, I'm actually using a project to do that. Now your project life cycle, whether this is very distinct pieces of the project or whether it is the overall, what we have to figure out is first of all, what are, what's the project all about? Whether that's an analysis phase or whether that's just an R&D, and then we have to figure out, plan it, prepare it, figure out how we're gonna do it. That could also include designing the actual, especially if we're talking about a product. And then we actually have to get the work done, which is the do part of it. And then at some point in time, remember we said a project has a beginning and an ending, and therefore we have to come up with this end point out there. Uh, so those are the actual generic portions of a project life cycle. They could be considered phases, they could just be considered the, the activities that you're going through when you're creating that product. If they are very specific, very succinct areas that you do this, that particular, for instance, uh, the analysis of what you're doing, the R&D, that's a phase. Once that phase is approved, then it moves into the next phase different names, different phases. These are normally identifying activities that would go on during that time. And the deliverables in many cases that would be able to show that you completed that particular phase. Now, once again, depending on your methodology that you're using depends on how this is done. If we have those phases and there are review points at a certain point in time, usually at the end of that phase, those are determining whether you have completed it, whether you've done enough to give you permission to go to the next phase. So a lot of times these are where I'm comparing what we've done back to the business case, which is really what was used to justify the project, the actual project charter, the benefit management plan, the project management plan, those are plans that we will create at the beginning and they'll continually be looked at to see if we're still in line with what we're doing. Now this phase gate though can go with a lot of different names. Could just be a phase review. It could be a stage gate, if those are stages we go through. It actually sometimes is considered a kill point. In other words, this is the point where I would look at what we've accomplished up to this, this point to determine if we continue to go farther or whether we basically kill the project. Your R&D probably has more of a kill point on it than anything. Based on the work they're doing, they come up with a point and say, okay, this is not working. Let's not go any farther. Let's go back and try something different. So it could also be the entrance point to a phase or it could be the exit at the completion of a phase. And we'll talk about phases as well as the project because all of the activities that we're doing could be part of a phase just as much as the overall project. Now, we also have a couple of things here. We talk about the project and the product. And the big thing that we have to realize is we have a scope for the project. That is the work that has to be done for us to complete the project, regardless of what the product is. And we're measuring that completion against what we said we would do, what we planned on doing in the project. The product scope, on the other hand, has to do with the features and the functions and the capability and all of the actual final result, the product. And more often than not, those are gonna be measured against some of the requirements for that product that we're given. They may be quality requirements, they may be functional, non-functional, all these different types of requirements a lot of times we talk about. 
The key that's important is that in most cases, the project scope is the responsibility of the project manager, but the product scope is usually the responsibility of either a product owner in Agile or a business analyst. So there are two different scopes identifying two different things. One is what do you need to do to finish the project? And what is the product going to look like when you're finished? A couple of other diagrams that we see, the fact that at the beginning of a project, you have your cost and your staffing are fairly low because in traditional project management, usually the man project manager and a few key individuals, leads, are the ones that do most of the planning. And after we've done that, then we bring the rest of the team on to do the work. It's a little different in an agile project, but for the most part, your staffing is going to build up as you get more people involved in the project. And then once we finish, then it's going to drop off dramatically. Some of the other characteristics, and this diagram actually is shown back in the standard, used to be in the PMBOK guide, but they've moved it back there. The idea at the beginning of the project, there's a lot of uncertainty. And as a result, there's a lot of risk. Risk is unknown. That's the uncertainty. That highest at the beginning and then as we understand more we're able to lower that curve now also at the same point is that if you're trying to make changes without impacting or having to redo stuff you have more ability to impact and influence at the beginning once you get into it for a while you realize that hey you know it's going to start costing if i make those changes Think about if you're building a house, up until a certain point in time, you have the ability to determine what kind of carpeting or lighting or whatever. But once you get to a certain point, you're kind of stuck and you have to make that decision. So after that, if you turn around and want to change it later, it's going to cost you more money than, than it would have if you had made the decision earlier. On the other hand, as I start looking at the cost, cost for those changes at the beginning, because usually the cost, the change is done on a piece of paper. It's not actually working in the walls and all the different equipment and things we're working through. So as we get farther, that change, that cost of that change is gonna go up. Now, this is the area that has changed, okay? This is where PMI has started to realize that, hey, there's not a single way to do any sort of project. And in fact, when we start talking about discipline and agile, even if we determine a way to, to apply as far as an approach, we can make a change to it if we see that's not working. Um, this is very well identified and explained in that agile practice guide, probably the best area where they talk about these different types of approaches. So, Let's just look at them one at a time. What they call the predictive life cycle could also be called a sequential life cycle. It could be called a waterfall. It's through to traditional, where you do a whole bunch of planning, identification up front as to what your scope and your schedule and all of those things are identified early on. And then you basically just do the work according to that plan. Once you start going, though, any change is going to have to be very tightly controlled. Okay. So your predictive, though, works in areas where we pretty much know what we're doing. We've done it before. We can work through in that environment. Um, if you're putting in, say, a financial system and you have accounts payable and accounts receivable, probably 90% of those we know up front what we're going to have to do. Maybe we change a little bit with a few things, but for the most part, something like that where we kind of agree, uh, it's been done a lot of times before, we can use more of a predictive type of a life cycle. An iterative life cycle really says, okay, so it's kind of predictive. A lot of times we'll use it for those prototypes or things, but what happens is, we're going to chunk. 
what we're doing. So go back to my example of, an, of a uh, financial system. I could chunk it and say, okay, I'm gonna put in accounts payable, do everything needed for accounts payable. And then I'm gonna put in accounts receivable and I'm gonna do everything there. So rather than trying to do the entire thing and waiting until the very end to deliver anything, we try to break it into smaller pieces. Now, this also happens when I have a lot of complexity or maybe a lot of changes that I need to take into account. Uh, I'll give you an example. I did a project using this approach with the San Diego Sheriff's Department, and we were doing it within the different areas that traffic accidents and use of force and all these different things. But we had one area which had to do with internal affairs, and they really wanted to change the way they did that. So they were looking at, okay, so how do we do it today? Where can we make those changes? We chunked it all by itself. So all the rest of the things could be worked on because we knew that was gonna take a long time. And truthfully, the sheriff wasn't gonna wait forever to get some sort of benefit or payback for the work we were doing. So chunking it into smaller pieces allowed us to get some pieces out and yet, still work on other sections of the project. So chunking iterative, I look more at as if we're chunking it, making it into smaller pieces, but we're still doing the same processes pretty much within each one of those cycles. The incremental though is a little bit more typical of an agile project or a product. So for instance, I'm going to use the example of the iPhone because it's probably the thing that most of us can associate with. But the idea that you know you come out with a, a cell phone and you get a release of that, and then you come out a few months later and you have made some improvements to it. Now the key becomes: are those improvements sufficient for me to go get rid of my old phone and buy a new one? Right now, so many people are, wait, were, are waiting for the 5G capability. And Apple actually came out with an iPhone a few months ago that, that was an upgrade to what was there right now, but it didn't have the 5G. And a lot of people didn't go with it because they were waiting. So when we talk about these minimal marketable features, those are the things like the 5G, like the three cameras, the uh, visual recognition, those type of things are what they're looking at as far as incrementally making this product more marketable, uh, people wanting it more so, and, and being willing to give up an older version of it. So those kind of fall into this area of adaptive. So adaptive can be either the incremental or the iterative, the idea it's based on change. It's not that you have everything you know up front, so why bother, you know, not, you know, why not just go through and do it in a traditional manner? Trying to respond to a lot of changes. You're not coming up with the details at the beginning. You are waiting until you get ready to work on something to dwell down into the detail because truthfully, if you, if you spend a lot of time analyzing or working on something that never gets prioritized is very important, you wasted a lot of time. And adaptive or agile is based on lean. And this is a matter of you don't do anything that doesn't provide value to you and you don't try to backtrack and have to redo things. So there are two ways you can do adaptive cycles. One is based on a time box, and this is very much a scrum type of a method. You have iterations or sprints where you have a time period, you prioritize what you're gonna do, you work on just those items during that period of time, and you produce something at the end that can be approved and signed off. And that's fine. The other one though is what is called flow-based. And flow-based is more like your manufacturing with the idea that you bring something in and you move it towards completion. Prioritized as to what you're working on. 
um, but moving that across as you go through that process. You're not time constrained on the actual delivery of that item, but rather you're still working, which always is any sort of adaptive, you're working on a prioritization. What's the most important and therefore we work on it first. There's a lot of times though when we will do a hybrid and this is once again what is in that Agile practice guide. He actually has pictures where he'll say, you know, the majority of the project is predictive, like maybe building a house, but there are certain pieces of it that might be done more in an adaptive manner. Or you might have an adaptive type of project where you're trying to come up with something new, but you do have some pieces of it, like maybe if I have to go and install some piece of equipment, that piece of equipment has to be installed in a certain order. So installation of equipment tends to be more of a traditional predictive type of a life cycle, as they would say. How we use it and how we do other things around it, improving the process, that can all be very definitely adaptive. So they talk about these various life cycles, these various approaches. Uh, and like I said, if, if, if you're not familiar with them, probably the best thing is to look at that practice guide, the Agile practice guide that came with the PMBOK, because he actually has pictures in there that, that really explain what these are and the difference. But the idea is that a team should look at what they're trying to do and determine which one of these works best. And then periodically go back and review and say, you know, maybe it didn't work quite as well as I thought. How about if I go back and try it? And I see a lot of people moving from a scrum or a time boxed into more of a Kanban because they just can't get anything accomplished in two to three weeks. That's just too small of a time period to work in. But that's one of those areas that have been introduced here and part of the how we've pulled in this idea of the whole Agile.